<laughs> Am I taking your turn? You're doing great. <laughs> it, you know, it's really good to see all you guys. I'm glad you guys were able to show up tonight. Um, why don't we go ahead, go ahead and start off with uh, prayer. Ask the Lord to be with us. Father God who is in heaven, we just praise you and honor your name for who you are. We know, Father, that uh, the, the lessons that we're um, going over this year are very, very important to molding us into the uh, children of God that you want us to be. Father, we can't do it without you. We ask that you would be here with us. And Lord, I pray that you would um, help me to, to get through this material um, and that if there are any experiences that, um, that I've gone through in my life, which I know that there have been many, but only those that you deem appropriate to share uh, with these men, I pray that you would be with us, Lord. Um, and, and I pray that every heart would be opened to, uh, to hear the truth and not only hear it, but, but receive it. Because, um, Father, I believe that every man that's in this room and everyone that will um, see this video will be challenged to look back in their lives and, and realize how they've been affected by the material that's in this, that's in this uh, message. We pray these things in the precious and the holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, uh, the structure in becoming a man of God. Once a solid foundation is established, then we have something to build upon that will make a difference in every sphere of our lives and in the lives of those around us. The name of this uh, lesson is The Man's Wisdom. James 3, verses 13 through 18 says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among us? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. The wisdom descendeth not, or this wisdom, descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. The greatest need for any man as he traverses through the maze of life is not wealth, it isn't fame, and it isn't health, but it's God's divine wisdom. And unfortunately for us, we were born in a world where um, we were not equipped initially with the tools that we needed to understand what God's wisdom is all about. So um, we ended up going through all the, the bumps and the crevices in our lives to realize something was wrong. This lesson's gonna help us. Uh, I, I know you, you guys are very seasoned and, and I'm sure that you already understand a lot of what we're gonna go through tonight, but I challenge you to still listen and, and hopefully um, realize that there's something in your life that still needs to be changed. The lessons or, or the lesson goals that we're going through tonight, number one is, is to fully understand the necessity of knowing and loving God by following his wisdom. Number two, to be directed by heavenly wisdom from the Lord and not earthly thinking from Satan. Number three, to be committed to learning scriptures that will empower you to develop wisdom from the Lord to lead you and or your family. And number four, to never allow pride to keep you in a place of self-promotion or lack of empathy for those who may be struggling. Number five, to never feel independent of the grace of God. The direction of a man's life determines where he will end. So every step must be correct. There are always two choices before us. One choice is directed by heavenly wisdom from the Lord, which 
which is spiritual, and the other is drawn by earthly wisdom if a man chooses it, which is carnal. James 3, verses 13 through 18, seen on the opening page, lays out the choices man has and can exemplify. Every man needs God's wisdom daily because seemingly small choices either lead to our goal or away from it. James 1, 5 through 8 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of the Lord that giveth to all that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Have you ever thought of yourself as being double-minded? Regardless of our vocations, secular or sacred, we all need God's heavenly wisdom not found in secular books, university programs, or motivational speakers. God's wisdom is readily available to any born-again Christian. Now, it's really important that if we have issues in our lives where we feel that there is someone that we need to reach out to, to, to help us get through, you know, uh, 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 let's say we're facing a very tough time and um, we're, we're wanting spiritual guidance. It's important that we know who it is that we're uh, asking to help us. You know, is that, is that, does that person have a good, strong foundation, spiritual foundation? Um, is he going to lead me down a road that, that'll eventually cause me to, um, you know, uh, be further away from the Lord. It's very important that uh, we get godly counsel. Resisting is man's problem. There is one great roadblock to attaining God's wisdom, and that's pride. Satan has been using pride as early as the Garden of Eden to cause man to fall. No other sin will do more to damn the floodgates of revival and drain the power of God's men than the pride which blinds us to its presence. It's amazing how a person that most everyone can see is prideful. It's just their character, yet that person doesn't know himself. I know men of God who teach others it's very obvious that they're very prideful because of the things that they say about other people behind their backs, mm -hmm. you know. Self-acceptance is not pride. Everyone who is saved is viewed as valuable in God's eyes. Ephesians 1, 6 through 8 says, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein hath made us accepted in the, belief, in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence. Understanding God's view of his children gives us confidence because we are loved and, acceptance, and accepted. That's not pride. We should accept ourselves the way God accepts us. After we are born again, obviously, we are now in his family and seen perfect through Jesus Christ. Rejoicing in honor is not pride. Honor means to esteem or regard highly, to merit, to respect. The Bible is filled with instructions to honor others, as it says, give honor to whom honor is due. A man should properly honor his wife. We need to also properly give the honor to those in authority over us, which is, I'm sorry, over us as they watch uh, over our souls. Satisfaction of a job well done is not pride. Colossians 3, verses 3 through 23 says, 
And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. You need to be diligent, committed, diligent, committed to do everything as to the Lord, a work at home, at work, at home, and at church. Do your best and rejoice in your work. And this, this is one thing that I, I have to remind myself of all the time uh, in that, you know, not all of us have the same gifts. Some of us have abilities that, are, that far exceeds others. Um, so uh, let's say that on your job, you, you, you believe, man, I'm, I'm just, I'm really so good at this, you know, and um, it's, uh, it hurts yourself to believe that what you're doing, no one else can do when the gifts that you have were given to you in the first place. Um, you know, I, I'm a musician and um, I spent a lot of hours trying to be seen as I know what I'm doing, right? But at the same time, regardless of how much time I spend just trying to be, you know, good, there are people across the world, um, like in India, 10-year-old boy who, you know, has been playing three years, three years, and his ability is far exceeds mine and a lot of other very good musicians that I've seen. So um, God gives us all. He disperses those gifts, you know, uh, differently. So I, I say all this to say that regardless to what you do and how good you are at it, there's no room for pride. No room for pride. Pride is feeling that you are independent of God. It includes ingratitude and self-centeredness. Here is, a, here is a simple quiz to determine if you harbor pride. Does it irritate you when someone corrects you for your faults? When you make a mistake, do you always have an alibi? When someone wrongs you, do you say, I don't need him? Do you find it hard to ask for advice? Do you find yourself ungrateful? Do you measure success by victories over others. Answering yes to any of these means you are proud. Proud reviles deity. God says he hates pride. Proverbs 16.5 says, everyone that is, pride, that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. James 4 verses 6 says, wherefore he said, God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. God hates pride because of what it does to us. So here is God's hate list. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Pride caused the greatest and most beautiful of God's angels, Lucifer, meaning light bearer, to become the devil. Ezekiel 28, five says that he was perfect in all of his ways, till iniquity was found in him. Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? The pride of man began in Eden and plunged the entire human race into its present sinful condition. Pride is an, is an insult to a gracious God. You know, therefore, negative effects of pride in our lives. Pride will put us into a negative state. The moment we allow pride to enter our hearts, it automatically puts us in a negative state. In this state, our perceptions get distorted. We start to see and interact with the world from a state of negativity. In this state, we are robbed 
of our gratitude. It causes us to lose our joy and our peace. And it also hurts those around us. It makes us self-centered. We began to overvalue ourselves and undervalue everyone else to the extent that the standards that we place on others rises to such an extreme to the point that no one is ever good enough. Everyone falls short of our high standards. Pride affects our senses. Our eyes are affected. We have hawk-eye vision on others' faults, but we're blinded to our own faults and mistakes. Pride affects our ears. We gain a selective hearing problem. We automatically reject the advice or correction or criticism that we don't agree with. We view it as, as a threat and our defense system goes up. Pride affects our sense of feeling. It prevents us from sympathizing and empathizing with others. It prioritizes the protection and expression of how we feel with no regard of how it affects others. We harden our hearts so that we can't express love. Pride reveals depravity. Our pride and our depravity makes us act like we do not need God constantly. How many days have we negle neglected personal time with God, reading his word and looking to him for direction in our lives? The opportunities for communion in prayer go by as we waste time pursuing our plans without consulting God. We were born with an old atomic nature, and so we are born with pride. Pride revives disunity. If we, if we say that we're not prideful, more than likely we're liars. According to Proverbs 13, verse 10, only by pride cometh contention. Have you ever had contention in your life? There has never been a war or conflict not caused by pride. Every church split, every argument, every marital disagreement, and every divorce are partially caused by pride. It is our pride or self-centeredness that creates disunity in our homes. Matthew 12 verses 25 states, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought into desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Our conflicts with others would soon be resolved if we laid aside our pride, humbled ourselves, and lived crucified, or lived a crucified life. 1 Corinthians 6, 7. Did I want to read this? Now therefore, there is utterly a fault among now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Ultimately we live in a way that just keeps the bleeding going due to our pride. Pride brings destruction. The scriptures are filled with examples of tragedies caused by pride. As Proverbs 15, 25 says, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud. In Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. Here are examples. Pride produces national ruin. Nations that turn against God will ultimately meet their end. What happened at the Tower of Babel and with Israel, God's chosen people are two examples of the results of national pride. Today, America is running quickly to the same ruin. Pride produces domestic ruin. <coughs> pride has destroyed or damaged millions of homes. Pride causes dysfunctional families because of men seek their own desires over the needs of their families. Pride produces a financial ruin. 
Pride causes man to want to outdo others. Therefore, they overspend and find themselves a slave to lenders. Men fail to learn the key to contentment and instead find themselves on a path to ruin. Our greatest effort in life shouldn't be to position ourselves to be better than someone else, but to surrendering ourselves to God's control of our lives. Pride produces spiritual ruin. The Bible is replete with stories of people with great potential who were ruined by pride. Saul, the first king of Israel, did, this, did his thing instead of following God's direct commands. Samuel promises God's cond condemnation in 1 Samuel 15, 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and adultery. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. God took the throne from him. If we lay aside our sinful pride, we can let God's divine wisdom control us. Receiving God's provision. Solomon was unique because his wisdom exceeded that of any man. Solomon said, Solomon asked God in 1 Kings 3, verses 7 through 9, and now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? Solomon's request pleased God, and who said in 1 Kings 3, verse 12, Behold, I have done according to thy works. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that, <coughs> so that there was no one like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. Solomon used his wisdom in many cases. The Bible is the source of all wisdom, according to Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore, keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not upon thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Trusting, acknowledge, and direct. A trusting confidence. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Trust is the only way to wisdom, just as we trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. We must trust him for daily wisdom. Do not trust in your own ideas and fleshly wisdom. Proverbs 28, 26 says, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Our trust in God is found in knowing him because we will not trust someone we do not know. John says we must abide in Christ. John 15, 1, verse 1 through 10 mentions abide nine times. Abiding speaks of a place a fellowship and communion with Christ, a deeper walk with the Lord will result in a deeper faith in our Savior. Salvation is a process. Once we accept Christ, He accepts us and puts His Spirit in us 
so that the process begins. We must trust His Spirit to guide us in wisdom daily. A total commitment. The passage continues with, in all thy ways acknowledge him, demanding a wholehearted decision to follow God's wisdom. Our job is to walk in wisdom by trusting in the Lord, reframing from our own understanding and acknowledging him in every area of our lives. A thrilling consequence. Well, before that, God is not a man that he should think and reason the way we do. His reasoning is far deeper because his knowledge is unlimited. A thrilling consequence. He shall direct thy path. He, it is God that directs our paths. We do not. God is all sufficient and gives us both direction and wisdom. He is omnipotent, infinite power, omniscient, unlimited knowing, and omnipresent everywhere at the same time, ready to give us what we need just when we need it. All the names in the Bible gives us so much insight of his capabilities. Notice that the name Lord, given many times over, is his name Jehovah, meaning the eternal, self-existent one who delights to reveal himself shall. It is not that he may or may not, but that he will engage himself with any child of God who wants to have his direction. So, he shall direct. His wisdom may come as we read his word in our devotions. When we hear the preaching or teaching of the scriptures and when praying, other times, he will, his will is revealed by his providence. That is, through circumstance as his leading is revealed. He shall direct thy paths. Sometimes the path is smooth. Sometimes the path that he chooses for us is rough and we must cling and rely on him completely. He is always by our side, ever ready to strengthen us. Psalms 37, 23 says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Our steps are literally prepared for us because he has blazed the trail ahead of us. God's will is not a roadmap, but it is a relationship. In this journey through the maze of life, we need a direction finder, which comes from the wisdom we have as we walk hand in hand with the Lord. Would you like to go through the uh, breakout questions now? Or do you guys want to have a discussion first? We'll pray first. How about that? Father God who is in heaven, we thank you for the milk and the honey and the meat of your word, Lord. We realize that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that is spoken out of the mouth of our God Almighty. We thank you for your word, Father. We thank you that it sustains us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father. We cannot survive without you, Father. No one knows more than you how weak we are, how prideful we are. We do seek, Father, to learn and live through your wisdom. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to be with us, continue to guide us, be our mentor. Show us your ways daily, Father, we pray, as we read and study your word and, and continue to, to keep good spiritual company daily. 
Father, we pray these things in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.